I'll wait for you, okay? Good morning. I want to welcome everyone here today. My name is Laura Smith, Member of Provincial Parliament for Thornhill, and it is my great honor to be here with my colleagues, Minister Stephen Lecce and Parliamentary Assistant Patrice Barnes, for this announcement and to celebrate the significant opening of the E.J. Sands School. It is also my very great pleasure to introduce our YRDSB colleagues, uh, Ron Lynn, Chair, Director of Education, Bill Kober, Grant Fothrop, who's the superintendent, and the, the individual who's going to be the principal of this beautiful new school, uh, Mary McCarricker. I want to thank everyone for being here in this new facility, including the new Le Club Child Care Center. A new school and child care center is such an important role in our community. And I reflect and I think about the impact it will have on our residents, the families, the local grandparents. I understand the great value it will have and provide for future generations. Um, and as a local mother, I recall in 2019, sitting in the Henderson Avenue Public School Library. Henderson Avenue, by the way, is about four minutes just uh, north or, or south of here. And we would discuss this issue constantly. We have a common goal. Parents, teachers, we want the best outcomes for our students. And the new EJ Sands School and the, more, and the significant curriculum uh, and the outpouring of support my, uh, my office has received on the newly announced STEM and financial literacy and cursive writing will provide a positive path forward for our students that brings a focus on the basics of education, student success and achievement. I want to thank the educators who are in the room right now and the staff at this school and across this province in helping deliver a positive new year for our students and families. I also want to thank the Minister of Education for his determination on bringing the basics of education back to life as a member of provincial parliament, but more importantly, as a mom. Thank you, and I will now pass the uh, microphone over to Minister Stephen Lecce. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, indeed, it is a positive day as we celebrate the opening of a new school in the, for, for the people of Thornhill, for young people in the province. And I want to thank uh, Laura Smith, who's been a very hardworking member, very proud MPP, working hard to make sure that young people in this community, like in every community, have access to a modern school. And it is exciting. I do want to thank the principal, the entire leadership team who will be commencing a new school and a new year, and it's something we should all look forward to. I want to give a thanks to the chair and to the director of education, as well as the entire team here at EJ Sands Public School. Of course, a special thanks to Patricia uh, DeGuire, the chief commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, as well as Jennifer Holmes, Wire, who's the president and CEO of Junior Achievement, both of them for joining us today. Now, as students head back to class, we want parents to know that we are listening to your priorities, and the first of which is to make sure that your kids stay in class all school year. Now, last Friday, we were able to sign a tentative agreement with the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation on a process that keeps students in class, ends the threat of strikes provincially and locally, ensures stability for your children. This means students in English speaking public high schools will be able to learn in class without disruption for the next three years should that agreement pass. We put students first by offering a to continue negotiating for a specific period of time and all remaining items after that time would be sent to binding interest arbitration, ensuring continuity of learning and peace and stability and a positive health of your children. And so today we've asked our remaining teacher unions to meet with the government to reach a similar review uh, agreement to sign this deal that will keep our kids in school. And we're urging the other unions to move quickly so that we can conclude negotiations. As I've said before, this should not take long. This will allow us to continue the process of negotiating. It permits collective bargaining and allows an independent arbitrator to come up with a fair settlement on any outstanding matters because our objective is clear. It is a stable peaceful, enjoyable year, and this is the win-win-win outcome we believe will benefit every child. And honestly, the greatest victory is for the students of this province who will be in class for three uninterrupted years of learning. Now, as I've said, we're putting common sense back at the center of our education system, and we're delivering on our commitment to keep raising the bar by boosting student achievement in the classroom with a focus, a refocus, 
on reading, writing, and math and STEM disciplines. And we're working hard to refocus our education system on what really matters to you, that is building those foundational skills supported by over $700 million, nearly $700 million more in base funding, as well as a $109 million investment in literacy and the hiring of 2,000 additional educators. Whether their kids choose to work in STEM, the skilled trades, healthcare, or the arts, your children need strong foundational reading, writing, and math skills, and a solid mental health literacy. You know, and parent want, parents want to know that their children are learning and improving and being prepared for future success. And they are rightfully concerned when their uh, child's school or school board is be lagging behind on EQAO results and other key performance indicators. And while that is not the case here in York Public, I will assure you, uh, it is challenges in other parts of Ontario. We have to meaningfully really zero in on how to lift performance and create more accountability in the system. It's why we're requiring every board for the first time starting this year to measure progress, publicly report on outcomes in key areas, and that includes the achievement of learning outcomes in core academic skills. Essentially, a strategy to lift EQAO results on reading, writing, and math. Secondary component is on preparing students for future success. That's to improve student graduation rates, the percentage of students participating in job skills, programs, and senior math and science courses. We will be measuring those data points. And finally, the third component deals with student engagement and well-being, and that is really to improve student attendance in school and their awareness of how to navigate for mental health supports. These standardized metrics will help school boards uh, really focus those boards on student achievement. It will help parents hold boards to account for their education, and it really will help support students most to improve their math marks which is why we're investing over $75, $71 million in a new math strategy. Now, this September, every board will have a dedicated math lead focus on effective and coordinated math achievement planning that leads to improved outcomes for students in math and standardized training for staff, including leading math curriculum implementation. We are doubling the number of math coaches in our schools to provide direct supports to both the educator as well as to our students. We're establishing for the first time a math action team which will work directly with school boards where the ministry could deploy these highly talented math experts into school boards that require um, those outcomes and those success rates to be lifted. It, is it our direct intervention to the lowest performing boards to up their game because we just really believe young people need to succeed and mathematics is such an important competence in our economy and our society. Never before in our province have we had a coordinated focus on improving math education and scores and therefore the prospects of future success in work. We're also bringing a new digital technology and innovations in the Changing World course. The old computer science course starts this September, replacing a course that was last updated in 2008. The world has changed over the past 15 years with the emergence of new technology and so this course builds on those new learnings with coding in the recent revised math and science curriculum. It will help, help ensure Ontario's leading jurisdiction in STEM education in this country. We're investing a million dollars for the next two years for 2024 for the, with the Ontario Science Centre to create virtual lesson plans and hands-on experiences students and teachers can benefit from. We saw the benefits of that just moments ago. We're grateful for the leveraging the expertise of our scientists at the centers. We're also appreciating that reading is arguably the most basic skill taught at a school, a skill which every student has the right to learn in an effective and systematic way. And it's why beginning this September, students in Ontario will be learning from a new evidence-based grade one to eight language and French curriculum aligned with the Ontario Human Rights Commission's Right to Read report. Children will now learn phonics and gain the ability to read and write words with both speed and accuracy. This new curriculum will allow students to develop foundational knowledge and skills in reading and writing and spelling and vocabulary and comprehension across every grade. And we're making sure that children do learn by mandatory protected time in grades one to three for foundational reading instruction. We're also funding screening tools and training to support teachers to help measure students' reading skills in senior kindergarten, grade one and grade two, to better support those that are behind. And for those students who need just a little extra help to get them up to those provincial standards, we're gonna be funding up to 700 additional literacy experts, literacy educators to provide that support. 
We're partnering with leading experts in this field to provide resources and training to support our educators of this new language curriculum. This includes $825,000 we're providing to Dyslexia Canada to develop in partnership with the International Dyslexia Association new resources and professional learning that will support the implementation of this curriculum. Students will further develop their oral communication, their reading, their writing, their digital media literacy skills that will be necessary for a life even beyond the classroom. Now we also know that in every stage of life from your first job to the full-time career uh, in a boardroom or on a construction site, wherever it may take you, you will need to learn how to manage your money. And that is why Ontario is launching new financial modules, financial literacy modules that will help students learn new concepts on how to create a budget, how to manage their money, how to protect themselves from financial scams and plan for long-term purchases like buying a home or a car. This is in addition to the $6.8 million investment we provided over three years that was announced in the last 2023 budget to help self-directed learning videos on financial literacy for those high school students to really help build up their capacities as they transition from high school into higher learning. You know, overall, I just want to say this coming school year is something we could be excited for. Parents obviously want the best for their children, and that includes the best quality education. And it starts as a first principle with keeping kids in the classroom and uninterrupted learning so that we can make sure these kids get back on track. And so, of course, as I've reaffirmed today, we look forward to meeting with all education unions, the teacher unions, so we can sign a deal. We can keep kids in class. We can ensure the health of our kids is prioritized, that their mental and their physical health, that their academic success, it really does hinge on this agreement. And so I'm asking our partners in the teacher unions to work with us to get this done. We look forward to a positive year with new accountability on school boards, a modern curriculum, 2,000 additional educators, and almost 700 million additional dollars when compared to last year in our base funding to help ensure it is a year of success in learning. So thank you uh, for this opportunity to preview what is uh, new for the coming school year. And I want to turn it over to the hardworking parliamentary assistant, Patrice Barnes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank York Region District School Board, EJ Sand Public School, and Principal Mary, Mary McCare for having us here today. I'm delighted to join you for this important announcement. Our government believes that it's imperative that students learn in a modern and safe classrooms, no matter where they attend school in Ontario. Young people are our future, and they are the key to ensuring a prosperous and vibrant economy. They need to be equipped with knowledge and skills that help them to achieve lifelong success. Positive mental health is essential for academic success, so it's critically important that we support the mental health needs of our students. That is why our government is improving mental health supports and learning within our schools. Beginning next month, new educator-led learning materials for grades 7 and 8 students that are aligned with the 2019 health and physical education curriculum will be introduced in classrooms. Use of these new mental health literacy modules will be mandatory beginning in January 2024 and are a part of our new requirements related to prompting student mental health. These modules include important tools for students such as providing activities, videos and interactive programming and information that will help students learn how to manage stress understanding the relationship between mental health and mental illness, recognizing the signs and symptoms of a mental health concern, counteracting mental health stigma, and knowing when and how to ask for help. In addition to introducing these learning modules, our government is increasing student mental health, health funding in schools to a historic 114 million in the 2023-24 year, representing an increase of 555% since 2018. We know that what matters most to parents across the province is student achievement and wellness. Our government will continue our commitment to parents with new measures that will better refocus school boards on academic achievement and the development of life and job skills. Though the recently passed, through the recently passed Better Schools Student Act, better known as Bill 98, our government will continue delivering on our commitment to improve student achievement. The Act lays the groundwork for a truly world-class, high-performance education system 
that will enable students to reach their full potential and, and prepare them for future successes. It would also improve accountability and transparency in our publicly funded school system, strengthen governance and leadership, and help to build modern schools faster. It will improve teacher training and education outer oversight, ensuring consistent approaches to student learning and parent engagement. As we prepare for a new school year, we're getting our students back to the basics with enhanced mental health learning and a focus on reading, writing, and math so that our students will have the skills and tool that they need to be successful now and in the future. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I'd like to pass the mic over to uh, the Chief Commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission, Patricia Dubai. Jolly good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister and Parliamentary Secretary, Madam Barnes and Minister Smith. To me, this is the best of times. I am honored to join the Ministry of Education for this announcement. The Commission is pleased that the Ministry of Education has evinced its commitment to children's right to read by adopting the recommendations of the All Right to Read Inquiry Report. A recommendation in our bucket list is the release of the English and French language curricula to align with evidence-based approach to early reading in 2023 and 2024 school year. Implementing the right to read recommendations require much collective work. I would be remiss if I do not acknowledge the enthusiasm of the teachers and the ongoing support from the International Dyslexia Association. Also, I want to highlight everyone's continued effort to socialize our recommendations to teachers, staff, and other literacy professionals. A fitting example of this is the Right to Read Book Club created by teachers for teachers. I mentioned Una Maxwell, Malcolm, Nelly Caruso, Kate Wynne, and Leigh Fett to help introduce teachers to the new curriculum. Such collaboration and partnership at all levels enable the growth of progress in this existential literacy endeavor. Thank you so very much for engaging so fully on the Right to Read report and believing, as we do, that the right to read is not only an essential human right, but also a universal tool for the empowerment of people. Thank you so very much. And to principal of this school, I do not envy you. I offer my volunteer efforts to help you on this wonderful journey, educating our children, empowering them for the future. And now I have the honor of introducing Jennifer Holmes Ware, President and CEO of JH Central Ontario. Thank you very much and good morning, Minister and guests. Thank you for the opportunity to join you here at the remarkable new EJ Sand Public School. It's a beautiful facility for learning for students. At JA, we equip young people with the life, employment, and entrepreneurship skills they need right now and in the future. By building skills and nurturing self-belief, JA prepares young people for the future of work, teaches them how to think entrepreneurially, and ensures they have the tools to be financially capable adults. Whether they're starting their own business, exploring career paths, or saving for a new bike, a strong foundation in math skills and financial literacy gives youth the practical toolkit they need to pursue opportunities, take smart risks, and think about the future. The ministry's focus on math achievement together with the ongoing integration of financial literacy into Ontario's curriculum, means students will have more opportunities to learn at each life stage, growing in confidence and their abilities over time. We know this makes them more likely to successfully apply these lessons in real life situations. Competency in math and financial literacy opens a world of possibilities for youth, fueling their dreams for the future. JA is proud to be a partner of Ontario's teachers, inspiring and preparing young people to succeed. And now I'd like to welcome 
the chair of the York Region District School Board, for his remarks. Good morning and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Ron Lin and I'm the proud chair of the York Region District School Board. Thank you, first of all, to Minister Lache for choosing one of our school to share this morning's important back to school announcement regarding the 2023-2024 school year. With September only a few days away, our board is excited to welcome our student back to school next week for another amazing school year. And I will now give the microphone back to the minister to open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. We will now open the floor for questions. Uh, please stand to the mic and state your name and outlet. Just a reminder, it's one question and one follow-up. First question. Hi, Minister Lecce. Hi there. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, in the 2,000 new educators you say are going to be available, how many have actually been hired, whether it's the math coaches or literacy-specific educators? Yeah, so there's uh, roughly 700 new literacy educators that school boards will be hiring for the coming school year. There's 300 additional math educators, doubling of the math coaches, and roughly 900 to 1,000 educators really focused on uh, those D-stream courses from grade 7 to 10. School boards are, of course, the employer. They're the ones doing the hiring. Uh, but I can assure you, uh, you know, they're working very hard to make sure that they've got the right staff in place to intervene. The overarching strategy here is get back to basics. There's a reason why those 2,000 educators are almost entirely focused on getting back to the basics, strengthening math and literacy competencies in the classroom. And so we've got new expectations, binding expectations on school boards, we have new supports in the classroom. We have a modern curriculum with new financial literacy resources, a new literacy curriculum that follows the precise advice of the Ontario Human Rights Commission when it comes to reverting to phonics and the inclusion of cursive writing and evidence-based instruction. So we're looking forward to building capacity and getting these kids back on track. Um, will Ontario bring in policies like we've seen in New Brunswick and now Saskatchewan to require that parents be informed if their children change gender identity at school? And I would love to hear from Patricia about this as well. Look, I think uh, it's important to note that every school must be safe for every child. I think we understand, though, that parents you know, must be fully involved and fully aware of what's happening in the life of their children. I mean, often there are health implications, and I think we, we have to respect the rights of parents, recognizing that these can be life-changing decisions. And I think parents want to be involved so that they can support their kids. And I think that's a really important principle that we must uphold. Is that, is that you are going to require it then, like with legislation? We're simply making clear as a province that we believe parents should be fully involved, fully aware uh, of what's happening to their children. And these are significant changes and they have a right to know. And so we would expect school boards to be transparent with parents as we always have. How do you respond to the criticism we've heard from, you know, that it puts some LGBTQ kids at risk where maybe they're not, you know, their home environment's not a safe place for them to be out or to have a right. different gender identity? No, for sure. I mean, this is why I led with the recognition that safety must prevail, the safety of the child, both at home and in school where there are exceptional circumstances where there can be situations of, of potential harm to a child, educators are well versed on exactly what to do and who to turn to if they believe that child may be harmed for whatever reason or whatever circumstance. The, we will always safeguard the right of children to be safe. We'll always ensure that that is the case. Educators do amazing work to recognize the signs and the changes in behavior and, and energy and attitude uh, they really do wear many hats, and we're grateful for what they do. But there's a well-established protocol to ensure the safety of children, and I have every confidence that what has been the case for many years will continue to be that they can leverage those um, that protocol if they believe something potentially could put the child at risk. But as I say, as an overarching value system, I really do believe um, that parents need to be fully aware, fully uh, engaged, and that school boards need to be transparent with, with, with parents. I mean, they are the legal guardians. They love their kids. They want to be aware of what's happening in the life of their children in their schools. And I think that that is really important that they know. So your position is that they should, but there's not a, a requirement to report or a, anything like that, any directive like that from the Ministry of Education? Uh, school boards will have policies. I'm just affirming to you the province's position on the matter quite clearly, which is parents have a right to know and we will respect parental rights. We think boards must do the same. Uh, Paul with CBC. 
Yes, Do you want to take away the right to strike for all teachers unions? Uh, no, we want to ensure their stability for children, which is why we're going to continue to negotiate in good faith with through collective bargaining right up to October 27th, have spirited discussions at the debate. And then should that not resolve the matters, we now have an independent third party credible interest arbitration system that we can turn to to help us resolve those issues while keeping kids in school. That's really the priority. It's what we've laid out. It's what's done in very other sectors from healthcare to uh, uh, a variety of other ministries. So I think this is a sensible step forward to provide stability for kids, but it does allow us to keep negotiating and keep working hard at the table. We're gonna respect um, that process, but we also can look forward to some stability, real stability for children because the threat of never ending strikes and withdrawal of services, I, I think we recognize it, it has some real, um, it can really set back kids, their academic and their physical and mental health too. So we've got a strategy laid out. We're encouraging boards to come, other uh, teacher unions to come forward to work with the province, meet with us. We're meeting with two of the un teacher unions this week. We'll meet with the third one next week. Uh, bottom line is we're gonna make the case that we've got a sensible plan here that is fair for the workers, that keeps kids in class, that provides needed stability at a critical time. Uh, and I hope that they will take us up on this offer and get this deal done as soon as possible so we can move forward with predictability for families that their kids are going to be in school for three straight years of uninterrupted learning. And just wondering about the language. You called it a tentative agreement and the unions called it a proposal. Yeah, we, we've, we've, we've signed, we've reached a tentative agreement on a process that averts a strike by allowing us to negotiate and in the absence of decisions being reached, we then turn to interest arbitration. Um, but let's not lose sight of what we've been able to achieve, which is a really positive step forward. It's a tentative framework that allows us to demonstrate to parents that we're gonna negotiate, we're gonna work hard, but we're gonna put the welfare and the interests of their kids first by ensuring that we have a plan to defer outstanding issues, should we need to, to an interest arbitration system, an interest arbitrator that is decided by all the parties. And I think that should give confidence to families uh, that, um, we're putting their kids first, that we're gonna provide stability for their children and ensure that they get back to class, back to basics, back to learning, and to some, frankly, healing after years of difficulty in Ontario schools. And as the school year is about to start, what is the current teacher shortage? Not, uh, not helpers or anything like that. And will students have a qualified teacher in the classroom? Well, I think, um, first off, school boards will be able to speak specifically to their local needs as the employer. What I can simply note is that we have taken actions to reduce the amount of time it takes to process new educators. Uh, we just passed a bill, Bill 98, the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act, that part of this vision is to reduce by 50% for international uh, educators to come into the province. So we're actually cutting the processing time for certification by half. Uh, that's now impl being implemented. Uh, we have expanded the amount of educators we're physically hiring. We're hiring 2,000 additional ones with the focus on literacy and math uh, and de streamed courses. So we're putting more capacity in place, more funding in place. We're reducing the red tape for processing of certification. We're working with the College of Teachers, faculties of education, or even this year permitting uh, on, a, on, a, on a permanent basis second year teacher candidates who are finishing their, their um, um, their bachelors of education to allow now to be allowed to work in schools to have additional human resource capacity. We, we don't want scenarios where there's, uh, you know, emergency monitors coming in. We want certified educators, and that's obviously what the, the the same vision of the school board. We're doing everything we can to provide the people in place, qualified people, so that they can really focus in the curriculum and help these kids learn every single day. What do you What do you think the timeline will be? You've introduced some new. Right. Uh, new achievements if you want to hit. What do you think the, the timeline will be that those new teachers will be in the classrooms? Oh, I, I suspect um, that school boards are uh, very motivated, incentivized to get these individuals in schools. Uh, I, I do believe that we'll see higher capacity, more educators, more math and literacy instructors in Ontario schools starting this September, and they'll scale up based on uh, the capacity on the ground. But I'm quite optimistic there. Uh, eager to get these people in schools uh, so that they can really help lift up performance on reading, writing, and math. Brian Lilly, Toronto Sun. Uh, I'm sure that your announcements today will be welcomed by most teachers, most parents, but you know that there's always a, there's a fight inside education and there's um, a level of politi uh, politi politicization of the education system. We, right. we saw that with 
um, group of math leads for some of the biggest boards in the, the country holding a, a conference earlier this year saying two plus two equals four equals white supremacy. So how do you say get back to basics in math, in mm -hmm. phonics, in all these other things when you've got people who want to use math, use reading for a political agenda? Yeah, I think what we're first of all emphasizing is that in the classroom we need young people to be taught how to learn. Not you know, there, our mission is really to teach critical thinking skills where they're encouraged to think for themselves, not to be told what to think. That's a first principle in 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 a school. Um, and it's why in the language curriculum we actually now mandate critical thinking skills. Part of the new reforms through Bill 98, the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act, is literally to respond to the challenge that school boards are not focused on those academic achievement targets. So for the first time in Ontario history, I as minister now have the legal power to set binding priorities on school boards uh, with respect to academic achievement. Measurable, public-facing metrics so we can measure improvement on reading, writing, and math, on graduation, on skills and science and math courses. We're, we're providing incentives um, and a focus to school boards that that has to be uh, their area, um, uh, their area of, of focus. And so that's the first one. You know, we've got accountability on school boards. The second is a new curriculum that actually emphasizes fundamental skills on cursive writing, on phonics, on financial literacy, on personal budgeting. This is life skills, job skills that have been often removed from the curriculum of the past that we're now infusing, more hands-on learning, practical learning. And of course, directors of education uh, through their uh, performance appraisals, we now have a role as minister in providing input on that to make sure that those directors are adhering to those provincial expectations on academic achievement. So this is the first time we actually have a wholesale reform to accountability. We're putting new resources in place and we're sending a clear, unambiguous signal to the education system that we need to get back to basics. We need kids to learn fundamental skills. And the EQAO data proves a very real problem, which is kids have regressed on those skills, and therefore our priority this September and every September has to be academic achievement. And we will hold school boards to account to ensure that they do that. Back to uh, what Siobhan was asking you about regarding uh, the gender issues. The Toronto District School Board's current policy says a school should never disclose a student's gender nonconformity or transgender status to the student's parents, guardians, or caregivers without the student's express, explicit prior consent. This is true regardless of the age of that student. So a four-year-old could say something to a teacher and suddenly their, their names change, their genders change at school. Parents are forbidden from finding out. Right. Um, why wouldn't you make it a, a policy uh, the way Saskatchewan and New Brunswick have? Uh, there's an Angus Reid mm -hmm. Institute poll out today saying 77% yeah. in Ontario uh, back this idea that yeah. parents should be informed. Well, I think what I'm communi communicating clearly is that as a province, we believe parents must be fully aware. Uh, we can have situations where information is being withheld from a, from a parent. We think that transparency is a strength. So we're sending out that clear message, uh, and we're also reaffirming the importance of the right of parents to support their kids, to help their children. Um, and I think that's really important that they are aware. So. Uh, with that said, obviously our priority remains uh, making sure that school boards get back to basics. Uh, it's why we've tried to make the case to school boards through now law and regulation that there must be binding focuses on student achievement, on academic success, on the back to basics emphasis. If we do that, we keep parents more informed. We've empowered parents through this bill to now be consulted on their priorities at least twice a year. Um, this is the cultural change I think parents want to see in Ontario schools, a refocused, more accountable, more disciplined, and frankly, um, with a greater emphasis on, uh, on foundational skills. And I think that's a really important thing we can do for Ontario families. Thank you. That's all the questions for today. Thank you for joining us.